Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on cyclic AMP signaling. And this video, what we're going to do is we're going to use our study of this micro-domain um, calcium homeostasis mechanism uh, to uh, talk about uh, an experimental technique known as fluorescence, fluorescence, fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Resonance. Is that how you spell resonance? I think it is. Uh, it might be an E there rather than a fluorescent resonance or resonance. Uh, fluorescence reson fluorescence resonance energy transfer. Okay, so it's often not you. People often don't use its full name. Instead, they just abbreviate it to F R E T or fret. All right. So what is fret? Now it sounds horrendously complicated, but it actually is very very simple. So, basically, it's a way of seeing whether proteins are very, very close together. So, let's just have a recap of our calcium homeostasis, um, our calcium homeostasis apparatus, our uh, store-operated calcium entry apparatus. Right, so let's say this is our cell membrane here. Then we know that uh, the apparatus occurs within a lipid raft. So this pink will denote that this uh, portion of uh, the cell membrane is a lipid raft. And then basically you have uh, cytoskeletal proteins demarcating the edge of our microdomain and then they are going to attach on this side to the um, endoplasmic reticulum membrane down here. Okay, so basically what happens is that calcium goes too low inside uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, that triggers a protein known as STIM1 to aggregate together. So these are STIM1 proteins, which have all aggregated together here. So this is a STIM1 aggregate. STIM1 aggregate. Okay, and those STIM1 aggregates activate a protein in the membrane known as the calcium release activated calcium channel or um, or you can also call it the store operated calcium channel and this store operated calcium channel or calcium release activated calcium channel um, so CRAC or SOC whichever one you want to call it uh, this is made up of four subunits and each one of these subunits is encoded for by a protein known as Aura I1 so each one is a protein known as Aura I1 okay right so STIM1 aggregates interact with the Aura I1 uh, subunits of this CRAC channel and basically cause it to open. So it adopts an open conformation and allows calcium to come in from the outside of the cell into this, the cytoplasm of this microdomain of the cell. Now, so calcium goes up in the cytoplasm of this microdomain of a cell. And we know that in the lipid rafts, you also have uh, adenylyl cyclase 8 enzyme. So here is an adenylyl cyclase 8 enzyme. And we know that calcium uh, activates these adenylyl cyclase 8 enzymes. Now, what was the purpose of bringing this calcium in here? So that we could refill the endoplasmic reticulum. So there is also a protein in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane known as the sarco endoplasmic reticulum uh, calcium ATPase, or CIRCA for short, which is going to pump this calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum down here, and uh, therefore you have achieved what you wanted to. Right, uh, so uh, we're going to talk about FRET in the um, context of trying to figure out these interactions here. So basically, we're going to use FRET to show that the STIM1 protein is very, very close to the crack protein, and also, uh, well, the, or this, this crack channel, and that the crack channel, the uh, calci uh, calcium release activated calcium channel, is uh, very, very close to uh, this adenylyl cyclase 8 subunit. In fact, they are bound to one another. And I've kind of drawn it the wrong way around because this channel is actually bound to the end terminus of adenylyl cyclase 8, so the amino terminus over here, uh, whereas I've drawn the carboxyl terminus over here. So this is adenylyl cyclase 8. Okay, right. Uh, so, this is the principle of threat then. 
We'll firstly use it to show that the uh, crack channel, this aura I uh, protein, is connected to the adenylalcyclase 8. So we'll get take out one aura I protein and show how it's linked to a single adenylalcyclase 8 subunit. Okay, so the structure of aura I, the transmembrane, the membrane spanning structure of aura I is that it has four transmembrane domains like so. So this is what the uh, membrane spanning topology of aura I looks like. It has four membrane spanning alpha helices like so. And basically it is linked to adenylalcyclase 8, the amino terminus of adenylalcyclase 8. So I'll draw in adenylalcyclase 8 here as so. Right, so there's adenylalcyclase 8 sitting in the phospholipid by there as well, and this bit attaches to this bit basically. So this is the carboxyl terminal of aura I1 adjoining to the amino terminal here, and they don't, sorry, that, I've, the way I've just said that suggests that, you know, it's the carboxyl terminal here linking to the actual amino group here. No, the whole proteins link. Uh, it's not like you're actually joining them in the polypeptide link, no, uh, but uh, you do sort of join them, they interact in some way, and the way that you can show that they interact in some way is using fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So basically, this is the principle of fluorescence resonance energy transfer. You attach onto the aura I uh, protein a fluorescent marker, such as uh, cyan fluorescent protein, CFP. So CFP stands for cyan fluorescent protein. And basically, when you shine a certain frequency of UV light onto that uh, fluorescent protein, it will uh, radiate blue light back out at you, so cyan fluorescence protein. Then what you do is you attach another fluorescent protein onto the amino terminus of um, this adenylalcyclase 8 uh, protein. So let's attach on a uh, yellow fluorescence protein onto the amino terminus of adenylalcyclase 8. So this is yellow fluorescence protein. And basically, again, uh, you can shine UV light at that um, uh, yellow fluorescence protein and it will uh, emit yellow light back out at you. Now the important thing is that you shine a different, a different frequency of UV to activate the cyan uh, fluorescence protein than to activate the yellow fluorescence protein. So you need to shine different frequencies of UV. Now, basically, if you shine UV light at the cyan fluorescence protein, what will happen is that the cyan fluorescence protein will absorb the UV light the yellow fluorescence protein will not absorb this UV light because the UV light is of the wrong frequency. So yellow fluorescence protein won't absorb the UV light. Now, when cyan fluorescence protein absorbs the uh, UV light, it gains energy from that UV light. Okay? Now, if these two proteins are really close, then the idea is that some of the energy that cyan fluorescence protein has gained from the UV light will be transferred to this protein here. So you'll get transfer energy from this uh, cyan fluorescence protein. To, uh, f well, you'll transfer energy from the cyan fluorescence protein to the yellow fluorescence protein. And when the yellow fluorescence protein gains energy, it will start emitting yellow light. So that is the idea behind FRET that you can see whether these two proteins, aura I1 and adenylalcyclase 8, are close to one another by looking at whether um, the, an activated cyan fluorescence protein, which I'm going to colour in blue, uh, can activate the yellow fluorescence protein of the neighbouring, uh, well, the conjectured to be neighbouring uh, protein. And indeed, what you see is basically when you shine on the right frequency of UV light to activate the cyan fluorescence protein, you see yellow light and blue light coming back, not just blue light. And that shows that these proteins must be very, very close together. So that's what FRET can be used to do. Fluorescent resonance energy transfer can be used to show that two proteins are very close together. Okay, so you can do another example of this is uh, trying to show that the aura I protein is connected with the stim1 proteins. So again, what we can do is we can take stim1 here, let's say this is stim1, and we can take another protein, uh, another fluorescence protein, which we'll use, we'll use green fluorescence protein this time, and again, what we can do is we can shine UV light 
at the cyan fluorescence protein and will shine the correct frequency to activate the cyan fluorescence protein, but not the correct frequency to activate green fluorescence protein. So the green fluorescence protein will not absorb the UV, but the cyan fluorescence protein will. Uh, and what will happen then is if these two um, proteins, Aura I1 and STIM1, are very close together, then the idea is that some of the energy that the cyan fluorescence protein receives from the UV will be transferred to the green fluorescence protein and the way that the green fluorescence protein gets rid of spare energy is that it emits green light. So, when you do this experiment, what you would expect to see is green and blue light coming back at you. Some blue light will come back from the cyan fluorescence protein, but you'll also get green light from the green fluorescence protein. And there's no reason why you can only do this for the cyan fluorescent protein. You can also fire the correct frequency of UV for the green fluorescence protein, and get that to activate the, uh, you know, give some of the spare energy to the cyan fluorescence protein, uh, rather than the way that we have been doing it. So we've been using the cyan fluorescence protein, we've been using the correct UV frequency to activate the cyan fluorescence protein, but we could have used the correct UV frequency to activate yellow fluorescence protein, or the correct UV frequency to activate green fluorescence protein. The principle is exactly the same that if the th fluorophore, as it's called, a fluorophore is just a molecule that will uh, interact with UV and then emit light for the rest for you, if the fluorophores are, are close enough to one another, they will transfer energy and both of them will emit light then. Um, whereas if they aren't, aren't close to one another, uh, you won't get light emitted by both of them. I.e. if it was not the case that Aura I won, was close to stim one. You'd only get blue light coming back, you wouldn't get green light coming back. But what you find is that when you do this experiment, you do get blue and green light coming back. So that's a way of confirming that Aura I1 and stim one aggregates. Oh, I should have said that, in fact. This is not just a single stim one molecule. This has to be a stim one aggregate. So you only get this happening when you have stim one aggregates. So in fact, this experiment does not work. So that's an important point. If you just do this on a normal cell, it doesn't work. When you shine UV, uh, which is the right frequency for cyan fluorescence protein, you do not get green fluorescence protein activated. So you just get blue light coming back. But if you uh, use the drug Fapsigargin to block circa, you, so you use Fapsigargin to block circa, and you uh, stimulate IP3 receptors. So you stimulate IP3 pathways to stimulate IP3 receptors, which are in the endoplasmic reticular membrane and will let calcium out of the um, out of the endoplasmic reticulum. Then what you overall do is you've activated this IP3 receptor, which is letting calcium out. You've used FAPSI gargin to block the circa, which will stop calcium coming back in. So you're going to deplete calcium in this store. So STIM1 is going to start aggregating. And basically, if you do that experiment and do FRET, fluorescence resonance energy transfer, what you see is that the, um, when you shine UV light on to the cyan fluorescence protein, you do get green and blue light coming back, which indicates now that STIM1 is close to Aura I1. So that, only, that connection only occurs when STIM1 is aggregated and not when STIM1 is not aggregated, i.e. when calcium is perfectly normal. So the STIM1 protein is only interacting uh, with the Aura I1 protein when, um, when calcium levels are very low and that's caused STIM1 to aggregate together.